afternoon and welcome to the Politics on the Public Mind series. This is our fourth presentation in the series on war, peace, and arms. Next in the series on November 18th is Joe Lenski, co-founder and executive vice president of Edison Research, who will speak on the midterm elections. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker, Mr. Scott Shane. Now a veteran correspondent in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times, Mr. Shane is an expert on national security issues. Before joining the New York Times in 2004, Mr. Shane served as a correspondent for the Baltimore Sun. From 1988 through 1991, he functioned as an on-the-scenes reporter in Moscow, Russia during the fall of the Soviet Union. He later published his experience in Moscow in his book, Dismantling Utopia, How Information Ended the Soviet Union. For those of you who are fans of The Wire, you may recognize Mr. Shane when he comes up here as a reporter in the fifth season. For the New York Times, Mr. Shane has written numerous articles concerning the nature of terrorist threats, the reorganization of the intelligence agencies, the government's secret effort to reclassify historical documents, the explosion in federal contracting for security abroad, and the Justice Department's secret legal opinions approving enhanced interrogation techniques. A question and answer session will be facilitated at the end of Mr. Shane's presentation by two students. If you have a question, please identify yourself and the microphone will be handed to you. Once you ask your question, we ask that you please hand the microphone back as there are many people in the audience who may have questions. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to introduce Mr. Scott Shane. Thank you everybody for coming today. Um, can, does this sound about right? Can everybody hear me in back? Okay, good. Um, so let me just tell you, uh, my wife once, who's a teacher, told me you really ought to tell people what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Um, so let me just tell you that I am going to talk um, for maybe 20 minutes or so about Anwar al life. I'll then fast forward through some slides um, just to kind of uh, illustrate what I've already talked about. And then I'll make a couple of broader points about Aleki and, and uh, sort of what he means in the um, terrorist world and what the United States uh, might do about him. And, uh, and then we'll throw it open to questions. I hope to leave enough time for, uh, for, to get a good discussion going. So uh, let me uh, start by just telling you ab uh, about this guy. He is, um, I think it's fair to say, that he is uh, among the, um, certainly the central figures, some, some people would almost say the central figure on the minds of counterterrorism officials in the United States these days. Um, Yemen has emerged as a major threat and the Al-Qaeda branch there called uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And he has become a sort of major propagandist for that, uh, for that outfit. And in some ways he's, he's larger even than that. Um, let me actually, okay, there, I'll put his picture up there uh, for you to stare at while I talk. Um, the, uh, you know, when I planned this topic uh, a couple months ago, I didn't really have an idea of how timely it would prove. Um, but as you know, back uh, last Thursday, Friday, into Friday, um, there were package bombs, uh, explosives hidden in printer cartridges that were uh, in cartridges that were sent from Yemen, uh, uh, apparently, although it hasn't been proven by Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, to uh, address to Chicago, uh, but apparently with the intention of blowing up the cargo planes in midair, perhaps over the United States. And uh, because of a tip from the Saudis, uh, those packages were intercepted in Dubai and in England, and the packages never uh, blew up. But um, there is uh, good reason to believe, uh, to surmise, that uh, this guy, Anwar al uh had something to do with that plot. And one reason I say that is that, the, uh, as we wrote in yesterday's New York Times, the, uh, the packages were addressed to historical figures, one uh, associated with the Spanish Inquisition and the uh, oppression of Muslims, uh, at that time, and another with the Second Crusade, uh, a guy who fought the Muslims and was eventually beheaded by uh, Saladin, the uh, Muslim leader. And uh, Awlaki, uh, like many of these um, uh, um, 
militants uh, has uh, in his head uh, this notion that for centuries uh, it's sort of been Islam against uh, the infidel. And so he, you know, he's, for him, the Iraq War and the Second Crusade are sort of, you know, just par parts of the same story. So the fact that those names were put in there almost like a kind of grisly inside joke, because in fact the packages were not intended to reach any recipient or to reach Chicago, as for, uh, you know, at least that's what the intelligence agencies are telling us. They were intended to blow up those planes in midair, so it was sort of an inside joke. Uh, but that is a touch that, um, that I think you know, might well uh, speak of his involvement in the plot. So let me tell you about uh, who he is, where he came from, and how he um, took on this prominent place in the picture of, of um, the terrorists that we face today. He, uh, he was born in New Mexico. Uh, he's an American citizen. His father, Nasser al-Alaki, uh, was a grad student at the University of New Mexico in agricultural science and spent several years studying there. Later was um, a, a faculty in Minnesota. Um, so young Anwar was born in 1971 in New Mexico by virtue of his uh, being born here as a U.S. citizen. He spent about seven years here, uh, his first seven years here. Uh, and then his uh, father and, and mother and family moved back to uh, Yemen. And uh, his father later uh, became uh, very prominent. He was uh, uh, agriculture minister and chancellor of two different universities. And the, uh, uh, the kid, Anwar, um, grew up, went to a, a fairly well-known school in Sana'a, the capital of Yemen. Um, and uh, so he spent his sort of formative years, his teenage years there from age seven to about age 19. And uh, one thing that's notable about that period of time is that was the first time he got interested in jihad. Now, um, what was the big jihad that was going on when he was uh, a young man? Anyone, any of these students know? It was, it was the, the uh, jihad against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, right? The Mujahideen were fighting the Soviets, and they had, uh, during the period, the whole time of that war, they had $4 billion in secret CIA aid to fight uh, that fight. So, in fact, um, you know, and Osama bin Laden was, of course, our ally at that time, fighting the same fight. So, uh, what, he, what really inspired him to take an interest in this whole notion of a holy war on behalf of Islam was fighting the Russians in Afghanistan. Something worth keeping in mind, one of the ironic twists of, of recent history. Um, when he was 19, his father um, dispatched him to the United States to follow, um, you know, essentially in the father's footsteps. The father had gotten this technical education in the United States and come back to Yemen to work in, in agriculture and eventually in academia. He, uh, he sent the son, the son arrived in Fort Collins, Colorado, Colorado State University and, uh, in 1990 and uh, signed up for the civil engineering course. Uh, and you know, as far as anyone knows, the family's plan, the father's plan certainly, was he would get a technical edu education like his father and he'd head back to Yemen and uh, you know, help out this uh, impoverished country of about 22, 23 million people, about the size of Texas, a very arid place, uh, and unlike um, some Middle Eastern uh, countries, very poor and uh, running out of the oil that it has, running out of water, um, in danger in the view of many uh, people of collapse. Uh, and uh, so they, they needed help from uh, sort of technocrats and that was apparently the family's plan. What happened instead was he did get his degree in engineering, but he uh, went to the local mosque that's right near the uh, Colorado State campus. Um, I visited all of this guy's uh, American mosques and talked to people who know him at each one. And his first mosque here was this little house that was actually a converted church near the Colorado State campus in Fort Collins. And it's a little uh, place without, a, without the money for, uh, to hire a professional imam to run it. 
So uh, on, at Friday prayers, uh, as you know in, in Islam, the, the big prayer service is on Friday. And uh, so they just have students and professors who rotate. And anyone who wants to and you know, who the others respect can, uh, can give the sermon. So he gave some sermons and found he had a knack at that. So he completed his, his engineering degree, but, he, um, but he, he took a different course. One of the summers, in fact, he had traveled to Afghanistan. Um, and by then, the Soviets had pulled out. The Soviets had pulled out in 89, the year before he arrived uh, at uh, Colorado State. But uh, there were still the Mujahideen were the big heroes there. And it was sort of a, um, a heroic place in the eyes of the Mujahideen, in the eyes of Al-Qaeda, which had just been founded by Osama bin Laden in those days. Um, they had conquered a superpower, right? They had conquered the Soviet Union. And that may be a, a bit of an oversimplification, but that was what they thought. And, uh, and so he came back to campus, his friends told me, uh, and was um, wearing around an Afghan hat that he'd gotten over there, almost sort of asked me where I spent my summer vacation kind of thing, you know, very proud of it. And uh, when he graduated with this engineering degree, instead of going into engineering or heading back to Yemen, he actually, um, he married a cousin and he moved to the Denver Islamic Society and became uh, the part-time imam. They, they had a, a slightly bigger mosque. They had a part-time imam there. He stayed there for uh, about a year or so. Um, and there was one little thing that happened there I found that might have been a sign of, of the future, and that was uh, there was a Saudi student uh, at the University of Denver who wanted to go join the jihad in Chechnya uh, against the Russians. And uh, allegedly, according to one of the elders of this mosque in Denver, um, Awlaki was encouraging it, and this elder thought it was a terrible idea, uh, and um, so they clashed over it, and a couple weeks later, Awlaki left the mosque, but he left not just because of that fight, he got, he, he got a much better job. So he, he moved to a much bigger mosque in San Diego, um, right on the edge of, outskirts of San Diego, and uh, so he had his own, his own full-time job, you know, and uh, a house uh, next door. And he had his wife, this cousin he had married, and they soon had two little kids. And uh, then in uh, 2001, he m got an even better job. And he became the imam at Dar al-Hijra Mosque outside Washington in, in uh, a Virginia suburb of Washington. One of the biggest mosques in the, um, in the Washington area and a real plum assignment, you know, um, the equivalent of a, of a sort of mega church in Christian terms. Um, so the guy's career was fabulous. The other thing that had happened was he had uh, begun to, uh, 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 he, he had looked for various business opportunities. And one of the business opportunities that he, uh, he looked into various get-rich-quick schemes. He went to Las Vegas, uh, I found on, you know, one of these things, buy gold, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, in that way, too, he's quite American. Um, but he, he actually found a business that was very successful, and that was recording his own sermons and lectures on CD. So this would not be known to the larger non-Muslim um, community, but within... Uh, the Muslim community in this country, in Britain, in Canada, um, he was very well known before he had anything to do with terrorism as a, uh, a lecturer on, um, on Islam. And let me just play you, if I can get this thing to work. This is, this is a YouTube video, and you know, I should say that just in today's paper there's a story that YouTube has agreed to pull down some of his videos, some of his talks. So I'm, I'm hoping some of these links that I've put on here will work, but if they don't, that you know, just means you're on the cutting edge of the news. Um, but most of what he's, uh, one point I should make is that most of what is up there um, from the lectures and sermons of Anwar Awlaki are um, unobjectionable uh, life of the Prophet Muhammad, life of the other prophets of Islam, life of the companions of the Prophet, very straightforward historical and religious stuff with no, um, no sort of overtones of, uh, of, of violence or of, you know, contemporary terrorism. So this is a lecture he gives on marriage. Let me just play just a little snatch of it because this is the way this guy has exercised his influence, is from becoming a figure 
through the internet, um, through his, um, you know, his sermons and his lectures reaching this huge global audience, particularly the English-speaking Muslim audience. Rasulullah has a relationship, family relationship with the four Khalifa. Two things here to note. Number one, marriage in those days was very easy. Very easy. Now we have complicated marriage so much. We have placed so much bureaucracy in marriage that unfortunately haram became easier than halal. In the time of the Sahaba, things were very simple. First of all, the nature of the Sahaba, as Abdullah bin Mas'ud says, they were the least superficial among people. They hated complications. And they lived a very simple life. And they loved... Okay, that's enough. That's just his lecture on marriage. Um, but it's very typical in the sense that he's what they call a Salafist. The Salafs were the um, original generation, the early generation of Islam after the time of Prophet Muhammad. And his, the Salafis uh, believe that that's what we need to do is go back and model ourselves on those times. So in talking about marriage, later in this lecture, he's talking about all the problems people have in their marriages. And he sounds almost like a marriage counselor or a preacher talking about marriage. But he, he links it back to marriages from the Quran, from the um, hadiths, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And so for him, it's, it's very much, um, you know, it's very much like any uh, fundamentalist preacher who goes back to the Bible, goes back to the original text, uh, you know, to, to comment on contemporary affairs. But he's very much, um, in his style, he's very much a sort of um, hip, young preacher. Um, that's his style. You know, you can easily imagine him um, translated, certainly during that period, this period of, that I'm talking about in the in the 90s up to 2001, like a hip young uh, preacher at a mega church um, with you know modern music and that kind of thing. That's that's sort of the cultural um, equivalent in in American Christianity. Um, so he had this great uh, career going, and now there's a, there was another side to this guy that was um, emerging uh, very slowly, and that. Uh, and, and it really only emerged um, after 9-11 became kind of known to the authorities uh, and became known publicly. And that was that uh, in 99, the FBI opened a counterterrorism investigation of him when he was still out in his San Diego mosque. And that was because he'd had contacts with certain figures that the FBI was worried about, was following around. They were considered to be fundraisers for terrorism, that kind of thing. And uh, they dropped, they closed that investigation. They decided, you know what, there's nothing wrong with this guy. He just, you know, the world of Islam in the United States is a small world. There are random connections. There's nothing to it. Um, but after 9-11, they found that two of the hijackers had worshipped in his uh, mosque in, uh, in San Diego. And one of those guys had followed him to the Virginia mosque. And uh, the other uh, congregants in the, uh, in the San Diego mosque said that he would spend uh, a lot of time with these guys. He, had, he sort of seemed to be a, a spiritual counselor of, sort, of sorts, these, these guys. So, the, um, so that obviously raised some eyebrows. And to this day, they really don't know what to make of that. The FBI believes that he was not in on the 9-11 plot. Uh, and one reason is they don't think that um, Osama bin Laden, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the guys who plotted 9-11, would ever have trusted an American citizen who, after all, had been at that point in the United States for more than a decade, um, you know, with foreknowledge of the plot. But, you know, it's, conce it's certainly conceivable that he was, that, that he got some inkling that these guys were up to no good and either encouraged them or did not dissuade them. Um, but what happened to Anwar al after 9-11 is very interesting. In, the, in Washington, um, as you can imagine, uh, th there was an intense interest all of a sudden in Islam. I mean, everybody remembers this, right? And uh, so the, uh, there were the, every reporter, including me, was looking for someone who could be a kind of articulate explainer of Islam. <clears throat> and here was this young, articulate uh, imam near Washington who 
spoke fluent English, American English, and uh, he, uh, you know, he just became everybody's favorite imam for just a period of a couple months there. Uh, and he was on PBS, he was quoted in the New York Times, he was quoted in the Washington Post, um, and he was saying all the right things, uh, if you want to put it that way. Um, he would, like a lot of other Americans, he would raise uh, questions about why 9-11 happened and, you know, that you should look at it in the context of American foreign policy and so on. But he condemned the violence um, and he, he um, you know, he spoke out about it and he, and then he also would explain Islam. So let me just play a clip. This is, believe it or not, from a WashingtonPost.com video of Anwar al explaining Ramadan, the, the Muslim holiday of Ramadan. Um, and uh, you'll see that he's, you know, he comes across as extremely non-threatening. Um, and you would never think of this guy as a terrorist. He's sort of almost the opposite of that. So we'll watch a little bit of this. This is called the Fajr prayer. He's showing a service and he's prayer. just describing and in the voiceover uh, uh, the, the holiday of Ramadan and what it means. And, and that's uh, him. Um, you see people in prayer. So much resources in his hands. And then he's preaching. If we spend our time in the mosque from the time of prayer until sunrise, and then we offer two voluntary uh, prayers, uh, that uh, this is a very rewardable act. So he lived, I went to his house, he lived in a the suburb of Washington. Together. Would have, so there's a Here he's driving his car to, a, to the home, the you'll see. We have, uh, very Baby suburban city. guy. The reason for the separation during all worship services is because in the time of worship there should be no distraction. He's talking about why the sexes are separate. This is his house. I've been to the house. He's no longer there. Actually, I'll check my email first. Hello? He checks his email. He's talking on his cell phone. Go to the, you know, this, uh, this guy is, is um, a very familiar yeah, character uh, to us. Um, Okay, now I, I, I'll, you know, it's just a clip, but, but I, that's just to make the point that um, this guy had a totally different persona. In, uh, this, this was made probably in the very, uh, let's see, this was probably made in about November of 2001. And um, so he was sort of the go-to imam to answer questions about Islam. He was all over the place on the web. He was all over the place on TV and radio and in the newspapers. Um, you know, some people believe uh, that he was always with Al-Qaeda and that he was just here sort of undercover, like one of these um, sleeper agents, uh, the, you know, the Russian sleeper agents that were here posing as, you know, everyday Americans. Um, and, uh, and there's, you know, you can make that case and that he was in on 9-11 and so on. The, uh, I don't actually believe that. Um, to me, as someone who's, who's listened to just about everything he's ever said and talked to a lot of people who know him and followed him, his course uh, around the United States, I think he was a guy who tried on a number of different personas. And uh, one, this one of the, the great explainer of a, a sort of moderate form of Islam, uh, Islam I think, was, was actually quite sincere. Um, but in any case, uh, history took a different course. And, uh, and I think one of the interesting questions to ask is why this guy was radicalized and when he was radicalized. It's, it's very difficult to answer, but one thing that happened, um, I'm going to play you something else, uh, is that in March of 2002, so we're talking five months after 9-11, there were raids by the FBI and other agencies on a number of Islamic institutions in Virginia and in several other places around the country, mostly in Virginia. And of course, he was by then very tied into the uh, Muslim community and the, the kind of inst Muslim institutions in Virginia. And um, apparently, these raids were done in a somewhat ham-handed fashion. They, I, someone told me about um, agents, you know, sort of a SWAT team busting into somebody's house, and the only person there was Grandma, and she was handcuffed to the radiator. And, uh, you know, I mean, so it was done in a, in a somewhat crude fashion and uh, probably with a great deal of unnecessary show. Uh, but in any case, this angered a lot of people in that world, uh, people who, who totally condemned terrorism. One of the people who was extremely angry about this was this guy, Anwar Aulaki. And uh, let me play for you a, um, 
if I can get it up here. Uh, okay, this is just um, an audio tape from the web. And this is him speaking to an audience at his mosque after these raids. On Wednesday, the federal or federal agencies raided 14 Islamic institutions and businesses. And yesterday, they raided two. Under the pretext of searching for ties to terrorists, this campaign that these agencies are leading against the Muslim community has outraged the community and is an indication of the dangerous route this war on terrorism is taking. These Islamic institutions that were raided in our vicinity in the Northern Virginia area and in Georgia include the Muslim World League, International Relief Organization, International Islamic Relief Organization, Success Foundation, International Institute for Islamic Thought, Triple IT, the Fiqh Council of North America, Graduate School of Islamic Social Sciences, SAR Foundation, SAR International, Safa Trust, Marjak Holdings, Marjak Investments, Marjak Poetry, uh, Poultry, Mina Corporation, Sterling Charitable Gift Fund, York Foundation, York International, African Muslim Agency, American Muslim Foundation, Heritage Education. So he's listing all these Virginia institutions that were raided. Let me just play a little bit more of that because I want you to catch the anger. Heritage Education Trust and on and on. Educational institutions and businesses. In addition to that, the directors of uh, these institutions simultaneously while the institutions were being raided their houses were also raided the federal agencies searched the houses they have taken uh, loaded computers and books and documents and uh, they came into one of the houses of a respectable Muslim leader in our area and they held his wife and daughter at gunpoint and they had them handcuffed for four hours not allowing them to wear their hijab and various other forms of abuse he said not allowing them to wear their hijab in other words these are religious uh, Muslim women who want to cover their hair they're at home, they didn't have their hair covered, and to have these men come in was insulting and so on. I'll just play, play a little tiny bit more. So, this is not now a war on terrorism. We need to all be clear about this. This is a war against Muslims. Okay, this is not now a war on terrorism. This is a war against Muslims. So, to me, this, this moment is a bit of a turning point. He's deciding on uh, where he's headed. And he doesn't want to anymore be the kind of nice guy imam who's explaining Ramadan to the non-Muslims. Um, he's very angry. Um, you know, and whether this is an act, whether this is sincere, you know, uh, who this guy really was, uh, you know, is, is, is still a matter of debate. But I, I really sense genuine anger on his part and uh, a real kind of turn at that point. Um, and at, you know, he also was extremely ambitious. So I talked to a fellow imam in Washington who had uh, lunch with him around this time, and he was saying, I, I, I think I'm going to leave the United States. The, the, the um, atmosphere for, for Muslims here is just, you, you know, um, I, I, I can't accept it. And, um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to leave. And he talked about maybe getting, uh, his own TV show in the Gulf, you know, in the, in the Gulf region, uh, you know, becoming a kind of TV preacher, um, or uh, possibly getting a university post in Yemen. He talked about various things. Um, 
What he did was he actually moved to London in 2002. And he, uh, as you probably know, uh, um, London, uh, the, the, the radical Muslim community in London is sometimes referred to as Londonistan. And, um, and it was a very uh, fertile soil for um, sort of radical thinking at that time. And he fell in with this crowd, and he was an extremely popular teacher and preacher. And, um, you know, the, he seems to have worked, uh, um, you know, uh, so, sort of there was a mutual influence uh, with some of the radical preachers in London at that time. He became more and more openly radical in his preaching, and he, um, but he also uh, kind of ran out of money. You know, no one's going to pay you much uh, for doing this teaching and preaching. So he decided uh, uh, around uh, 2004 to move to Yemen. His family's prominent there. They have money. They got, you know, uh, houses and, and so on. And he moves back there, and he becomes, uh, again, a kind of preacher, teacher. He's also studying at a radical university in Sana'a, in the capital of Yemen. And um, he is arrested um, as part of some kind of tribal dispute that he intervened in. And he's held for 18 months. Um, and at first, this may have been part of a tribal dispute, but uh, at some point, the Yemeni authorities, this guy's an American after all. Remember, he's an American citizen. He's locked up without charges in a, in, in a jail in Sana'a, not the most pleasant place to be locked up. And uh, he's uh, questioned by the FBI in this, in this prison because by then they figured out about the, the, the guys who were in his mosque who turned out to be 9-11 hijackers. They're trying to figure out, you know, what was this guy doing all that time and what was his real story? So they come and see him and talk to him in, in prison there in Yemen. And he suspects uh, that he's being held longer than he would otherwise have been held, much longer, because the U.S. wants him held. And he's not wrong in reporting uh, on this story. I, uh, I talked to American and Yemeni officials who said that um, the Yemenis, after he'd been locked up for a few months, went to John Negroponte, then the Director of National Intelligence of the United States, and said, what should we do with this guy? He's an American, you know. <laughs> we got no charges against him. And Negroponte let it, let it be known that the U.S. would not object to his staying a while longer. Because they, you know, they were very confused about this guy. They didn't know whether he'd been a, a secret agent of Al-Qaeda for years or what. But in any case, by now, he was, he was a well-recognized jihadist uh, radical preacher. So that, this, that advice to the Yemenis actually made the FBI quite uncomfortable. They didn't like the idea of encouraging a foreign government to lock up and keep locked up an American who was not charged with anything in, any, in either country. Um, so eventually, after being about 18 months, at the end of 07, he was released. And uh, people who know him say that, well, first of all, he did a lot of reading when he was in there, and he read the works of um, a guy named Said Qutb, who is essentially the, the, the great um, ideologist of, of modern jihad. and. Um, so he had a lot of time to think about things and a lot of time to get a little bit angry. Um, and so people who know him say that he came out of prison much, much harder, uh, much more committed to the idea that maybe violence against uh, the West, against the United States, wasn't such a bad idea after all. Um, and uh, he started a website, however. He, he recognized where his talents lay. And it was sort of in the English language propaganda, propagation of, of this idea, of this radical ideology. He started a website, and he uh, became very popular on Facebook. Um, and uh, he, his website, um, which I'll show you an image of in a little while, uh, had you know, a kind of thing where you could write into him. And uh, one of the people who wrote into him was an army major, a psychiatrist named Nidal Hassan, the name may, may be familiar because he wrote into him and said in 2008 and said, uh, Dear uh, Imam uh, Anwar al um I, you know, just want some religious advice on something. If uh, I were to kill uh, American soldiers who are preparing to deploy to Afghanistan, uh, would that be okay in the eyes of Islam? And, uh, you know, we don't, his, his answers have not been made public, but it's pretty obvious that he said, go for it. And as a result, 13 people are dead, uh, uh, you know, in the Fort Hood shootings about a year ago. Um, 
after that, he, uh, you know, his website was shut down. He went into hiding with Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, according to American intelligence agencies, at least, he had a, a direct role in training um, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, the uh, young Nigerian man who got on that flight to Detroit last Christmas Day uh, from Amsterdam and uh, tried to set the, you know, blow up the whole plane with his underwear bomb. Um, so uh, at that point, um, you know, according again to American intelligence, he'd crossed over. For, there was always this question about this guy. He's an American, and he's expressing views through his website, through his CDs, through his preaching, and so on. You know, there was discomfort with the idea that you would go after this guy with the full force of the law or the government because, um, you know, there's freedom of speech, right? Um, unpopular views are, are uh, you know, the, the, they're protected by the First Amendment. So, uh, but w certainly uh, with the Christmas attack, um, the CIA believes that he was involved in recruiting, training, encouraging, not the hands-on bomb stuff, but the, the, the kind of uh, supplying of, of, uh, of this bomber um, to Al-Qaeda for this attack that almost brought that plane down, um, that really just through pure luck did not. The other thing that I should say is that in more than a dozen plots in the United States, in England, and in, Ca in Canada, uh, since 2006, when um, there are raids and, you know, the FBI agents go in uh, or the authorities in Britain and Canada go in and they seize people, you know, these are usually young people who are very web savvy, they seize their laptops, they look at what's on them and they always find the influence of this guy and his preaching, which is very insidious in a way because he begins by telling you about Islam. That was, you know, he was a very, you know, he's sort of a mainstream, straightforward preacher for a long time and extremely popular, as I said. He has a 53 CD, three volume set on the life of the Prophet Muhammad, which is sort of popularizing um, these traditional stories from Islam. Um, but then, you know, over time, he's become radicalized and he's gone from mainstream to, you know, fairly extreme jihad. So, um, so in all of these plots, when they, when they go in and look at the materials, they find that he's been very influential as recently as yesterday. Um, you know, we have in the Times today a story about a woman charged with stabbing a, a member of parliament in Britain. Um, and she has told the investigators that she listened for hours to this guy's, um, you know, encouragement jihad. So the reason, and that's why YouTube has come under pressure to take some of this stuff down. And um, so now I will actually play something uh, for you that, um, tells you sort of where he's, uh, where he's gone lately. Um, this is sort of, you know, it's been a gradual process, but um, this, is, this is the kind of stuff that he's put out in recent months. An address by Anwar al All praise is due to Allah, and may peace and blessings be upon his messenger like a lot Muhammad, of these with Arabic his from family, the Quran. and his companions. Peace be upon those who follow the guidance. To the American people I say, do you remember the good old days when Americans were enjoying the blessings of security and peace? When the word terrorism was rarely invoked and when you were oblivious to any threats? I remember a time when you could purchase an airline ticket from the classified section of your local or college newspaper and use it even though it was issued to a different name because no one would bother asking you for an ID before boarding a plane. Now listen to that. This is a guy who went to college in this country, right? And he's talking about buying an air ticket, like a discount air ticket that's advertised. I'm sure that the, the newspaper here on campus has those kinds of ads. So he's so American, you know, that's... No long look, lines, a more. no elaborate searchers, no body scans, no sniffing dogs, no taking off your shoes and emptying your pockets. You were a nation at ease. But America thought that it could threaten the lives of others, kill and invade, occupy and plunder, and conspire without bearing the consequences of its actions. 911 was the answer of the millions of people who suffer from American aggression. Okay, so you get the idea. This is a far cry from the guy who was explaining Ramadan, right? <laughs> this guy, I mean, it goes on to, to justify the killing of American civilians. And, um, 
and this is essentially an Al Qaeda, uh, you, you know, audio tape, or you know, the way it's presented here is a video. Um, I want to leave plenty of time for questions, so uh, let me just um, run very quickly through um, a PowerPoint uh, slide show that um, that just sort of rehashes um, some pictures from what we're, uh, you know, what we've just been talking about. Um, this is our friend Alaki. Uh, this is his mosque in um, in San Diego. Um, this is uh, one of you know you can find these all over the web for sale. And again, you know, there's there's nothing objectionable in this except that what's happened to the to the preacher since then. But this is Lives of the Prophets by Anwar Alaki. You know, a handy set of CDs uh, for your car. Um, <laughs> Uh, the travel edition it's called. This is Dar al-Hijra Mosque in Fairfax, Virginia, where he moved his last mosque, where he was on 9-11. Um, you know, much bigger and fancier. Uh, really one of, the, one, one of the big mosques in the United States and certainly in DC. Um, this is his website, uh, Anwar Aulaki Online, where you could write into him and so on. And there's, um, this is uh, sort of an infamous posting that he put up after the Fort Hood shooting, Nidal Hassan did the right thing, and he calls Nidal Hassan a hero. Um, that his his website got taken down, uh, you know, by the computer companies after that. Uh, here's his Facebook page; it's down now, but that's what it looked like. Um, this is more recently, uh, just in recent months, um, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the Yemeni branch, Yemeni and Saudi branch of Al Qaeda has put out an English language, a slick English language magazine called Inspire. And it's, it's almost um, ridiculous. You can, I don't know if you can make it out, but one of the headlines on the, um, on the cover there the, of this first issue was, make a bomb in the kitchen of your mom, the AQ chef. So it's done with a kind of weird sense of humor, um, but it's very serious about terrorism. Um, and uh, this is a close-up of the top of that first edition. May our souls be sacrificed for you, Sheikh Anwar al awlaki So th this is what he's doing now. Um, this is uh, the, the frame from one of his videos online. That's the black flag of Al-Qaeda and the symbol of Al-Qaeda against the moon there. Um, and this is a picture after the U.S. The U.S. has had several missile strikes against Al-Qaeda in Yemen. And this, the, the first two were in December, last December. And after one of them killed uh, a number of Al-Qaeda people, but also supposedly about 41 civilians, Al-Qaeda saw it as a great opportunity to call a rally. And this is a, an Al-Qaeda rally. Uh, Anwar al -Liki was nowhere in sight. Um, but, th but that's the, um, OK, now we're back to him. So let me um, just uh, introduce the question period by raising a couple of issues. One is, why am I talking about this guy? Uh, why do I think he's such an important and difficult figure for the United States to deal with? Because of radicalization. If there's not radicalization going on, if young people aren't being recruited to this cause, um, you know, Al Qaeda is going to die off, and we're all going to forget about taking our shoes off in, in, in airport lines and worrying about nine, another 9 11. Um, but this guy has managed to um, convert uh, people, not to Islam, but from one brand of, of moderate mainstream Islam to this radical, violent version of Islam. And so the radicalization process that he seems to have gone through in his life, he is replicating the lives of other young people. Very small numbers, let's face it, tiny numbers. But let's also face it that you don't need very many people um, to cause a whole lot of trouble. And um, so as we saw with those package bombs, uh, you know, th th there, are, there are people who are putting package bombs on planes trying to blow them up over Chicago. Um, the second thing I want to raise uh, as an introduction to questions is what are we going to do about this guy? Um, early this year, very early this year, he became the first American citizen approved uh, by the Obama administration to be put on the CIA's kill or capture list. So that was the government of the United States in a secret process. We wrote about it, but it was never announced. Um, in a secret process, decides that he is enough of a threat to the United States that even though he's an American, and even though 
you're theoretically innocent until proven guilty. If they find him out there somewhere in the desert of Yemen and they can get a shot at him, they'll drop a missile on him. You know, and um, so that set off quite an interesting legal debate over whether this guy is, on the one hand, an enemy combatant who deserves to be killed if we can catch him because he's, he's fighting a war against us, or an American citizen with due process rights who, who's li you know, whose liberty and property should not be taken from him and life should not be taken from him without at least some court somewhere saying this guy's guilty of something. So that debate's been kind of going on in, among national security lawyers. And um, so with that, let me, um, let me cut off uh, um, this talk and uh, throw it open to questions, either about Anwar al uh about these issues of what we should do about him, whether targeted killing would be justified, uh, or indeed about you know, the New York Times or anything else you want to talk about. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, um, uh, my name is uh, Jake, and um, I would like to uh, thank you for coming to visit uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University and for the uh, excellent presentation. And I've got the first question to ask you. Uh, it seems like in a lot of conversations about Al Qaeda that it takes many years, decades even, to kind of rise up through the ranks. But with uh, this guy, it seemed like it almost happened overnight. Uh, why is that? Is there a specific reason, or is he considered to be just that good at his uh, job? You know, that, that's a great question because. Um, you know, um, I, I think it has to do with skill and ambition and maybe the right place at the right time. Uh, the thing that separates this guy from most um, radical preachers is his English. And not just the fact that he speaks English, but he speaks English, as you heard, almost without an accent. Basically, he speaks American English. And he's also young. And, uh, you know, I didn't play some of this stuff, but he, he's, very, uh, he's oft, often very colloquial in his speech. So he'll say, in one of these um, uh, videos, he talks about um, Joe Sixpack and Sally Soccer Mom. And, uh, you know, he's very kind of, you know, he'll, he'll refer to popular culture. And so he's like a, a popular young professor. And he popped up right at a moment when, in history, when it seems there was, there was a niche to be filled in the kind of jihadi world, in the Al Qaeda world, and I think that, so. It's I think a combination of his skills and being in the at the right place, at the right time. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. Don't you believe uh, America could have could demonstrate a non war with Islam people as opposed to terrorists by allowing the mosque near Ground Zero? I'm offended that they won't allow it. That, uh, that people are rising up against it because it's not at ground zero. It's no more at ground zero than century 21 is at ground zero. If, if, you, if you start a perimeter and think, well, two blocks is too close, what is yeah. a perimeter that Islam should be? Well, I think, that, I think that's sort of what um, uh, the dilemma that's posed by that kind of extremely emotional debate. You can certainly sympathize with um, people who lost loved ones on 9-11 and who may harbor, um, you know, understandably great anger and sadness and bitterness <clears throat> towards that event and may feel um, resentful at the idea of a mosque uh, thriving there since the crime was committed in the name of Islam, however distorted. Um, at the same time, you know, the trouble with that kind of thinking, and a lot of people in the FBI and CIA will tell you this, uh, is that it tends to associate the terrorists who pulled off 9-11 with all Muslims. And not only is that unfair, but it is totally counterproductive. If, if you think of what that gentleman was asking about, how do you keep people from being radicalized? Well, you know, not to hold up this guy as, as an example, but, you know, I really do think that one of the steps in his radicalization, his path towards becoming one of the great enemies of the United States, was uh, the ham-handed way in which these raids were done on various institutions that he argues, and that other Muslims in Virginia argue, were mainstream institutions that were nothing to do with 9-11. So, you know, you can see how, um, how tricky an issue like that uh, so-called Ground Zero Mosque is um, in, in, in the question of radicalization, what contributes to this problem. 
Uh, the United States recently sold some fighter jets to Saudi Arabia. Is this a quid pro quo for the intelligence that was released? And that was a really neat trick, getting that intelligence. How did they do Great that? question. I mean, the Saudis um, have an interesting history um, that's maybe worth uh, talking about briefly. As everybody probably remembers, 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi, right, in 9-11. Um, the Saudis had encouraged this, um, this fundamentalist, um, um, very rigid uh, form of Islam called Wahhabism um, and had financed its growth around the world and had sort of made a deal, uh, a tacit arrangement with the uh, militants that as long as you leave the Saudi monarchy al alone, you know, we won't worry about what you're up to. And, um, and this turns out to have been a bad mistake. So in, in 2003, there began to be some pretty serious attacks on, in, the, in Saudi Arabia against Saudi institutions. And it was clear that al-Qaeda was basically going after the monarchy and after this, the, the power structure there. So they, tuned, they changed their tune. And um, they became quite active in repressing al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia. And that's one reason the, uh, the al-Qaeda folks moved into Yemen which, as you may know, is just uh, on the south end of the Arabian Peninsula. There's a long border with Saudi Arabia, so they fled there. So this group that, that uh, Awlaki is associated with, AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, is largely Saudi uh, with, a, with a bunch of Yemenis as well. Um, but it's very, basically one group, and it's in Yemen because the Saudis cracked down. Now, the other thing that's happened is the Saudis began to work more and more closely with the United States. And John Brennan, who's Obama's counterterrorism advisor in the White House, is a former uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia station chief for the CIA, who knows the Saudis very well. And he's very tight with a guy named Mohammed bin Nayef, who's a, a Saudi prince, who's a deputy interior minister, but really the guy, their chief counterterrorism strategist. So Brennan and uh, Mohammed bin Nayef have, have worked very closely together on a lot of these issues. And so last Thursday night, um, the phone rang, and it was Ben Nayef calling Brennan, saying, guess what? We think there are some packages being mailed from Yemen with bombs inside. Uh, and that's, and not right away, I understand, but by the next day, by Friday morning or maybe late Thursday night, uh, the Saudis actually provided the tracking numbers of these packages. So they went to the handy uh, UPS and FedEx. One was sent by UPS, one by FedEx. They went to the website put in the tracking numbers, like some of you may have done with sending you know, a, a birthday present across the country. And uh, they were found one in, near Nottingham, England, and the other in Dubai, and they went and took them off and um, avoided um, you know, disaster. So now the Saudis, um, while they were long seen as sort of part of the problem, they have at least some, to some degree become a, a part of the solution, and we're working very closely with them now. I have a question, but I have... Uh Two comments before the question. Do you really think that it's possible that we could get back to uh, traveling the way we used to? Considering the media uh, has brought forth to the world what can be done one person. Do you really think we're ever going to get back there? That's uh, one comment that I would like to have an answer to, if you can. Sure. You go ahead and ask your, answer, ask your other if you want, and then I'll answer them both. Um, at what point? Does does uh, radical preachings like this become treason? Well, what, he has to go to trial, mm -hmm. or is he declared an out? It's it is hard to imagine um, how you know anytime soon certainly that we're going to get back to um, you know uh, avoiding the um, you know the sh the ritual of taking that everyone's used to now of taking your shoes off and taking your laptop out and so on going through security checks at the same time you know um, you know people put up with that and and uh, tr life goes on. Um, it's not like a, a, an enormous inconvenience to go through that, and it's one that most air travelers are willing to put up with. Um, I guess the, uh, but you make a very good point, which is that one person or a very small group of people um, can wreak havoc uh, and, you know, paralyze a whole country. Um, there was some question about, well, these parcel bombs on two jets, one UPS jet and one FedEx jet. Let's say they'd gone off. Let's say they'd gone off over Chicago. Well, how bad that would be? You know, kill a couple pilots on each plane. But we're not talking about 9/11 scale. Um, maybe it would scare some people. Maybe even hurt some people if the parts, you know, the flaming wreckage fell somewhere. 
But the other thing it would probably have done uh, for at least a period of time is, is paralyze um, air cargo. Um, you probably would have had pilots refusing to fly. Um, it's apparently impossible, just volume-wise, to really inspect all the cargo that flies around the world. So it would have an enormous um, economic impact. And how much did this cost them? This is what the government calls asymmetric warfare. You know, how much did this cost them? It cost them, you know, I don't know, 50 bucks for the, uh, you know, maybe let's, let's be generous and say a couple hundred bucks for the supplies. Um, well, actually, they had to buy the printer and the cartridge. So let's, let's say it cost them $1,000, all told. And their risk was basically zero. And so that is what they call asymmetric warfare. And that's, that's a big problem. Now, on the question of has Anwar al-Awlaki committed treason, um, you know, I think by most people's standards, by going on the web and calling for attacks on the United States, uh, including attacks on uh, American civilians, I think he probably meets the standard. But the problem with that is, and indeed there may be a sealed indictment, often the government um, charges somebody and then seals, keeps the indictment sealed uh, for, for sort of tactical reasons. But he's hiding in the mountains of Yemen, no, no one knows where he is. Um, if they find him, it's probably more likely that they will hit him with a missile uh, rather than try and catch him and bring him back to this country for trial. But it could go either way. Now, have we got time for another couple? Yeah, okay. For comments, um, I thought the first question in your response was, was very, very important. Because um, another example uh, goes back to Adam Gadan, who is another American who has rose, risen very, very quickly within the ranks of Al Qaeda. And I think uh, the, the linguistic part of it is very, very important. And probably also the symbolic part of it as well, that they're showing that one of our own you know, yes. is willing to turn. Yeah. And that also um, connects with the point, uh, I think it was very important you pointed out, um, his reading Syed Qutb, because the parallels were there. I mean, remarkably, Qutb became yes. radicalized during his time in Colorado. Yes, he yes. He came here to study our education yes. system and went back. And, um, and then the other parallel is with the prison. So I wonder, you know, time in prison also is another common thing that we yes. see. So we should maybe be looking at college campuses <laughs> and prisons not to connect <laughs> those two, but uh, it's an interesting place. But my question to you as a journalist is, because um, you've alluded to this point several times, how do we navigate this very slippery slope um, with censorship, shutting down people's websites, their Facebook pages, and so forth? Yeah. Um, because I think we see it not only with, um, with this Islamic terrorism that we see, but the hate um, yeah. throughout the United States now, the white supremacist groups sure. and so forth. It's all online these days. Yeah. So it, it is a very tough question. I think one, you know, when I wrote this long story about Anwar al-Lucky for the Times, I, en I ended it by saying, that no matter what happens with Alecky, whether they drop a missile on him, whether they arrest him and take him away to prison for life, um, his message is likely to stay, to live on basically forever on the web. Because if YouTube takes um, the more radical of his writings down, there's many, many people who would put them up on their websites. And if you surf around uh, with Alecky, just give it a try, you'll find him all over the place. And you cannot really remove him. So you really have to counter his message in, uh, you, you, you have to counter his message, you know, sort of in the American tradition of free speech. You can't, you can't really censor it out of existence. The web is too big. Yes, thank you for the speech. I do want to ask, because just listening to Alaki's comments, there is a bit of a discontinuity between our traditional idea of jihad as a sort of struggle to spread the Islamic faith and his reasonings for you know, the murder of American civilians. And it seems like in Al-Qaeda's recruitment strategy, there's this definite appeal to sort of international relations and sort of self-sufficiency of the Islamic people, people that's different from this idea of spreading the faith and the sort of Islamic hegemony over the world. Well, that's also, also it seems, in our idea of them sort of at the core of their tenets. How much, th these are two contrasting ideas, how much how much do we see in their recruitment, and how much do we see, you know, from what you know and what we know of, of their actual beliefs? Is, is it just a front that they point towards, you know, these international excesses and imperialism? Is it just a front for spreading Islam, or is it that their real motivation? The Obama administration, as a matter of policy, has um, tried to avoid calling these guys jihadists or calling this 
thing a jihad or calling it Islamic terrorism because they, they want to keep a big chasm between Muslims who are terrorists and Muslims who are not uh, because they think it's um, a, uh, a total distortion, and most Muslims would agree, a total distortion of the religion to say that the religion somehow justifies the slaughter of innocent Americans. Um, and they don't want, they feel that the terrorist Al-Qaeda has hijacked a religion and they don't want to encourage that kind of thing, so they avoid that language. But a lot of conservatives and Republicans have come back and said, ah, they won't label this terrorism as Islamic. And they're being politically correct. And, um, and so there's this debate going on right now as to what this is. I think from, from the point of view of a guy like Aliki and the, the hardcore Bin Laden, those guys, they do see, um, they argue certainly, and I think, we, you know, I think they believe, have convinced themselves, that this is some kind of defensive jihad, that Allah has this plan that the whole world will be Muslim and that they, you know, they're the kind of instruments. And so um, you know, they gotta wipe out these um, enemies of Islam so that Islam can spread and the whole, you know, this caliphate, as you'll, you'll hear, um, can, you know, sort of take, uh, take over the, the world. Um, the the uh, chances of this happening are very slim, I'd say. But um, they can certainly make a lot of trouble in the meantime. Um, so anyway, those are great questions. Thank you very much for coming out on this rainy day and listening.